All right, class. Now there's a lot of science fiction universes out there, but the Dune universe in particular is one of the most complete, immersive, you can get lost in, takes place over thousands of years, complicated, ridiculous universe. So I'm gonna give you the things you need to know to get started and to understand what's going on within the series. So let's get started with our timeline of the Dune universe. That sounds complicated. It is complicated, but that's why we're doing this. So I can help make it less complicated. Oh golly, I'm so excited. Here's the timeline. About 11,000 years from now, man has used his technology to take its stars. We've colonized space and we live in a galactic empire on many worlds across the galaxy. Now, there are no alien species in the Dune universe, but there is artificial intelligence. Problems arise in the year 200 BG when there is a revolution called the Balerian Jihad, which lasts about 100 years in which mankind has decided to violently expunge all computers or thinking machines with the new commandment, thou shalt not make a machine in the likeness of the human mind, being put inside of their Bible, the Orange Catholic Bible, becoming universally agreed upon by all of mankind, even calculators are banned. They were really serious about this. Wait, wait, what? You're saying that robots are outlawed? Yes. <laughs> this, this may not be the science fiction series for you, robot. Maybe you should go check out some Asimov stuff. But for the rest of us, Let's keep going. And the reason Herbert came up with the Butlerian Jihad was because it's a device that enables him to write the ultimate humanist science fiction novel in order to focus on social and philosophical issues rather than technological ones. I can't believe you would read this filth. All right, all right, stop being disruptive. It's just a story, calm down. Let's keep going. Teacher, I love the concept of humanism. Tell me more. All right, Space Brain. Humanism is a philosophy that emphasizes the value of humans, both individually and collectively. So when the novel Dune begins, which takes place another 10,000 years after the Balerian Jihad, a total of about 21,000 years from today, you have a society of humans who have honed their own minds and bodies to be able to do extraordinary things we once thought only machines were capable of. Humanism. Sounds like another way of saying robo-bigotry. Look, Herbert felt that computers are used as a crutch and stand in the way of us developing our own mental abilities. Wow, that's a fascinating concept. Oh yeah, well, without computers and robots, humans couldn't do anything. Well, you're right, robot. Since thinking machines were out, humanity had to come up with some new ways to deal with their problems. The Mintat Order was developed who specialized in training people with certain mental aptitudes to become human computers capable of organizing, collating, calculating, and synthesizing huge amounts of data. From this data, they are able to concisely analyze varying outcomes and deliver useful conclusions and highly valuable insights. Mintats are employed extensively by the Great Houses as both political and military advisors. Oh wow, I would love to become a Mintat! Fun fact, Space Brain, Mintats can double or even triple their brain's immense processing power through using Sappho juice, an addictive substance that stains the lips. Cool! It is by will alone I set my mind in motion. It is by the juice of Sappho that thoughts acquire speed, the lips acquire stains, the stains become a warning. It is by will alone I set my mind in motion. Speaking of addictive substances, you can't talk about Dune without talking about the Spice Melange. Here you go again, trying to talk about drugs to children. <laughs> well, this is a fictional drug, so you can't get it on the streets. Neat, tell me about the Spice. The Spice Melange is a substance found only on one planet, the desert planet of Arrakis, which is known for its giant sandworms and really miserable hot weather. Now, this narcotic was first used as a geriatric drug because when taken regularly, it can double or even quadruple one's life expectancy. And it also makes one immune to like most diseases. Wow, that's an amazing substance. Yes, but there's a downside. Once one becomes hooked to the spice, you have to keep taking it for the rest of your life. And if you stop taking it, you will suffer from insanity and eventual death. Now addiction to the spice is marked by blue within blue eyes called the eyes of Ibop. Other curious side effects of the drug include the expansion of one's awareness of time and space. Essentially, 
ingesting mass quantities of spice in some people can create prescience, the ability to see into the future, which is harnessed and utilized by two groups in particular, the Guild and the Bene Gesserit. See into the future? That's right. With drugs? Yes, <laughs> with drugs. The Spacing Guild is a monopoly that uses spice-induced prescience in their secret method of space-folding interstellar travel. That's right, the spice is essentially the gasoline that runs the universe. You can't get anywhere without it. Now this is achieved via a scientific theory known as the Holtzman Effect, used in tandem with guild navigators, who are artificially super evolved humans who kind of look like weird wormy creatures, and they depend upon the spice melange for their prescience in order to safely navigate their ships through galactic space. Oh, gross. What is that? Yeah, you're right, robot. Guild navigators look really gross. Looks kind of like space brain. Hey. The Bene Gesserit Order, on the other hand, is a sisterhood who uses the spice to bring out a variety of abilities in its members, most notably administering a highly toxic spice concentrate known as the Water of Life to advanced adepts who then must consciously convert the poison into a benign substance within their own bodies or die trying. Now, this immensely painful process is known as the spice agony, and it causes the sister's genetic memories to emerge, allowing her essentially to gain the memories of all of her genetic ancestors on the female side. And then after surviving the spice agony, she becomes known as a reverend mother of the sisterhood, which is like the highest thing you could be besides the mother superior of the sisterhood. Wait, wait, let me get this straight. <laughs> So we're talking about a world where everyone is racist against robots and they all do drugs. Yes. If this is your favorite book. Maybe. <laughs> I love this story. The Bene Gesserit poses as a religious order, but it's really not. And its primary objective is to attain political power and influence in order to work behind the scenes to indirectly direct humanity upon a path of insight and stability. So are these Bene Gesserit a benevolent organization? I tend to think that they are. They're kind of like the moms of humanity, you know, but they will give you a spanking if you cross them. So 21,000 years in the future, we have the start of Dune. Now, Paul, our main character, is considered a Kwisatz Haderach by the Bene Gesserit Order. A Kwisatz Haderach? Yes. Uh, what is this? Kwisatz Haderach is the universe's super being. According to Bene Gesserit, it is a person who is able to access their other memory, something that they're able to do, at least the Reverend Mothers, where they can go and talk to their genetic ancestors, right? But like the Bene Gesserit, they can only talk to the female half of their line because like they're all women and for some reason they can't contact the male half of their line. So like the Kwisatz Haderach is a man who has other memory who's able to talk to both the female and masculine genetic ancestors. Oh. Yeah. That's what I thought it was. He can look into the past through the genetic memories of his ancestors while also being able to see the myriad future timelines because he's prescient. Wow, he can see all possible futures? He can. What an amazing ability. It is, but it also makes him really bored because you know, then there's like no surprises in life. In Dune Messiah, Paul has two kids, Leto II and Ganima. Now he ends up disappearing into the desert and is presumed dead. In the next book, Children of Dune, his sister Alia has taken over the regency until she is killed in a confrontation with her nephew, Leto, who bonds with some sand trout and converts himself to a human sandworm hybrid. Wait, wait, what? Yes, it gets really weird. It just keeps getting weirder. Oh, this is the part where it gets weird. <laughs> so in the next book, God Emperor of Dune, uh, it takes place 3,500 years after the last book, where Leto II is still around, he rules as God Emperor of the Imperium, and he sets humanity upon his golden path. He ends war, severely limits spice production, space travel, and outlaws mentats. 
Now, Leto's death marks the dissolution of the Imperium and the beginning of the famine times and the scattering, in which humanity once more takes to the stars, going beyond the boundaries of the old Imperium and into the unknown, furthering the evolution of the species, social structures, and technology. The next books, Heretics of Dune and Chapter House Dune, take place some 1500 years after the scattering, with the Lost Ones escaping back to the Old Imperium in search of Bene Gesserit knowledge in order to defend themselves against an unknown threat. The Atreides, the Quizax, Chatterax is still alive through all these 15,000 years? No, no, he was only in the first three books and then He's dead when God Emperor takes over and it's his son who lives as a worm god for thousands of years who's going on, but now he's gone too. So now we have all new characters. Although there is one character who is in all the books, but the character of Duncan Idaho kind of pops up and he's, he's throughout the whole series because they keep making golas of him, which are like clones where, but they has his old memories and shit like that. It's totally nuts. Like it's totally nuts. Chapter House Dune is the last of the Dune books written by Frank Herbert. And every day, I wish I lived in the alternate timeline where Frank Herbert had been able to finish the seventh and final book in his Dune series before his death, where he was moving towards showing a political renaissance and what kind of governments could evolve out of the situation that he had created. But as I learned from Dune, Arrakis teaches the attitude of the knife chopping off what's incomplete and saying, now it's complete because it ended here. Teacher, what do you think the seventh book would have been about? Well, the seventh book, I don't know, it's gonna be crazy, okay? He's like really gonna tell us like what kind of government we really need. Cause like that's this whole thing is about like crazy governments, like how systems work. Now I'll never know. I'll never know his answer to our political problems. I guess we're screwed. <clears throat> what is what is the message? What is the statement well, that, that you're attempting to make here? Uh, don't trust leaders to always be right. <clears throat> uh, I, I worked to create a, a leader in this book who would be really an attractive, charismatic person for all the good reasons, not for any bad reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, then power comes to him. He makes decisions. Some of his decisions made for millions of people, millions upon millions of people, don't work out too well. You've said science fiction writing can have a missionary impact. Could you elaborate on that for me a little bit? Well, I think it first has to be entertaining <clears throat> because if it's not entertaining, nobody's going to read it. Uh, I put a, a pot of message in there with a mess of pottage. <laughs> <laughs> Teacher, well, one more question. What's one of your favorite Frank Herbert quotes? He's got so many great ones. Oh gosh, Space Brain, there's so many, but let me start you out with this one. All governments suffer a reoccurring problem power attracts pathological personalities. It is not that power corrupts, but that it is magnetic to the corruptible. Such people have a tendency to become drunk on violence, a condition to which they are quickly addicted. Oh, well that's very relevant to what's going on right now. <laughs> you bet your ass. <laughs> Another one of my personal favorites comes from Chapter House Dune, in which Frank Herbert says, Seek freedom and become captive of your desires. Seek discipline and find your liberty. Oh, I've been working on my discipline. Shut up, Space Brain. Now, the Dune Saga are not the only science fiction books that Frank Herbert wrote. He also wrote The Dasadi Experiment, Destination Void, The White Plague, The Whipping Star, The Godmakers, and The Jesus Incident. These novels also deal with a lot of similar themes that are found in Dune, such as the problems of charismatic leaders, the relationships between religion, politics, and power, the effects and consequences of consciousness-altering chemicals, human survival and evolution, and more. In his writing, Frank Herbert explored all the complex ideas about everything from society to politics to religion to power to ecology to philosophy. He was able to see mankind and our world from a higher perspective, promoting not only the survival and evolution of the human race, but also the power of the individual. As he stated himself, no matter how exotic human civilization becomes, no matter the developments of life and society, nor the complexity of the human-machine interface, there always comes interludes of lonely power when the course of humankind, the very future of humankind, depends upon the relatively simple actions of single individuals. So if I read Dune, will I be smarter? I mean, if you can understand it and take something from it, yeah. I feel like 
you should read Dune. It makes you smarter. It does. In fact, if somebody's like, I don't like Dune, I judge them. And I'm like, I don't want to be your friend. <laughs> All right, class, it's time for your homework assignment. First and foremost, just read the Dune Saga. There are six books in all. Some people can't get past God Emperor, but I swear, just give it a shot. It's totally amazing. I also highly recommend the 2013 documentary, Yodorowsky's Dune. And for extra credit, for those of you out there who may already be onto Dune, but you need more in your life, check out the out of print Dune Encyclopedia. This baby is written as if you are in the Dune universe. It's out of print, how am I gonna get it? You can get it on Amazon, it's fine. This thing's got all sorts of weird stuff. It's got songs, it's got maps, it's got chemical compounds for things. It's amazing. Join us next time on Greater Creators where we're going to discuss the works of other amazing creators who influenced generations. Class dismissed. <laughs> <laughs>